So what do we know about this man? Well, 76, he's the first Jesuit Pope that there has, ever has been, uh, and the first non-European for about 700 years. No, 1,300 years, sorry, it was 80, um, 70 roughly, um, 700 when there was uh, a first uh, non-European, but about 1,300 years since there was a non-European. So quite a different mould, the mould was broken. Jesuits, if you've never read the Jesuit oath, just Google it and you'll see, not all the Jesuits take the uh, Jesuit oath, but the more important ones do. Uh, Jesuits currently have about 18,000 members, it makes them the biggest Catholic order. But uh, their oath is to promote the church through thick and thin, doesn't matter whether you murder or tell lies or deceive or whatever, your aim is to promote the church. Now, he has shown remarkable skills. Right from the very first moment of when he was elected as Pope, he didn't use the word Pope. Uh, he made his emphasis that he was Bishop of Rome. Now, this was to reach out to the Orthodox churches. This has been the great stumbling block between the Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church, the supremacy of the Pope. By not using that title of Pope, but saying, well, I'm just Bishop of Rome, as you're Bishop of Constantinople or Bishop of uh, Moscow, then it reduced the office uh, to a, a same level. And in fact, for the first time in, uh, since the big split in 1054, after his um, being revealed as Pope, after a few weeks, there was the grand ceremony of his uh, ordination, as it were. And for the first time, the representatives from the um, Eastern Orthodox churches uh, came. The Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople attended the ceremony. First time since 1054. So that, that was quite significant. And there's great talk about some much better relationships between the Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, is for the Pope to be able to go to Moscow. Um, that's not uh, in near time, but it is what they're working towards, this healing of the breaches. So he, he reached out to the Orthodox and is still reaching out. His eschewing of the pomp and ceremony, quite remarkable. Um, the change, you know, he catches a bus, he drives an old car, he doesn't uh, live in the Vatican Palace anymore, he just lives in the uh, hostel, as it were. Completely different man. And of course, this has strong appeal to the people of Europe, especially in Italy, which is uh, undergoing a lot of problems, financial crisis. Here is a man after their heart. And the crowds that have been flocking to listen to him are far greater than any other pope. He has a huge audience. He's aiming to reduce the power of the curia. It will give him more control. What he and is now just emerging just in the last week, what is emerging is his seeking to decentralise and move power out from the curia out to the bishops of the various countries. It's very interesting, you know, we're seeing exactly the same situation in the EU. People are rebelling against all this centralisation. They want power to be returned to the people, as it were. Now, that's exactly the same process that the, the Pope is uh, setting out upon that pathway. The problem is, centralisation just slows everything down. People can't get answers to their problems. Uh, if it could be dealt with more locally, then things would move more swiftly. The other great change is his outreach to the Muslims. And he has done this by choosing to dedicate his ministry to Our Lady of Fatima. That's one of the titles of Mary. She was allegedly, a uh, hundred years ago, supposed to have appeared in 1917 to three um, shepherd children in Fatima in Portugal. And there has grown a huge... Um, 
industry of Mary worship and pilgrimage to Fatima. Now, Fatima the, is named after the town in Portugal called Fatima, and that was given its name from Fatima, the daughter of Mohammed. Way back, Mohammed had um, 13 wives, but he only had two sons and four daughters. And of those children, only one, Fatima, actually gave him grandchildren. So Fatima, his daughter, is greatly revered by the Mohammedans. And we know that uh, in the 7th century AD, the Muslim power swept all across North Africa and up into Spain and Portugal, uh, and then got broken and pushed away. But uh, a strong Catholic influence in Portugal remained. And it was uh, in the 12th, 13th century that a uh, Muslim princess of the name of Fatima gave the, her name to the town where she lived. And this gave rise to, this was the place where this alleged uh, uh, appearance of Mary took place centuries later. So Fatima is a name which has strong resonance with the Muslims. And interestingly, when Muhammad was writing the Quran, if he actually did write it, but it is alleged that he did. He names no women in the Quran apart from Mary. And there are about 34 references in the Quran to Mary. And so the Muslims have a great respect for Jesus. They don't believe he was the Messiah, but he was the prophet, and have a great respect for Mary. So by the Pope taking this title, Our Lady of Fatima, Mary associated with Fatima, it, it has a strong resonance with the Muslims, uh, and this is part of his outreach to bring them in. He also has worked very closely with the Jews. Unlike his predecessors, he is very friendly to the Jews, and that dates back years and years, not just since he became Pope. Uh, in uh, Argentine, where he was, I think it was um, back in 79, I haven't got the, written the date down, but there was uh, a Jewish embassy was blown up. A lot of Jews were killed in one of the atrocities. Um, and he went out of his way to help the Jews and has had a very close bond with the Jews uh, ever since. Uh, quite a different attitude to the Jews than Benedict. Um, we'll come back to this uh, in a moment. As I said, he's getting huge crowds, he's very popular with the people, and his uh, World Youth Day in Brazil was absolutely a tremendous success. Again, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. He's not afraid to use modern communications. He's taken up what well, Benedict has started, Twitter, he has, uh, of the um, world leaders, he is number two behind Obama. But because he has so many retweets, those who understand these things will know what it's all about, he actually has the biggest following uh, in the world. And just a month ago, you probably remember this picture, he, the selfies, again a new language for the older generation, but... Uh, uh, who was quite happy to be posted uh, on there, and is quite happy to write to the press. There was uh, a long article by the founder of this, or the owner, sorry, not the founder, the owner, um, of the La Repubblica in uh, Italy, who was an atheist, and he wrote an atheistic article, and the Pope sent a long reply, which uh, was published, um, and in fact uh, quite moved the uh, this uh, owner to um, thank the Pope very much for what he had written. And so, an extraordinary man who's not afraid to pick up the phone and talk to people around the world that he hears have come, you know, had problems or difficulties. He'll pick the phone and phone them, you know, completely unheard of um, in a Pope. Um, uh, he is an extraordinary man. 
you can see he's being fitted for the job. And what we're looking for is to move Europe back to its Christian roots, its Roman Catholic roots. And there was an article just last week in the Huffington Post from America, uh, Pope Francis and the Future of Europe. European political leadership is desperately in need of a new energy and vision. Within Europe's ongoing deep malaise, an unexpected element has appeared. The new pontiff, Pope Francis. It's not implausible to think that a contemporary pope might have a significant effect on European affairs. And he picked up a phrase that uh, Pope Francis had used in a very long interview. Um, and this, this phrase was that belonging to a people has a strong theological value. In the history of salvation, God has saved a people. There is no full identity without belonging to a people. In other words, he was saying we, we, we have to identify ourselves as the people of God in this case. But you need a strong identity that people can react with and react to. Uh, and the article then went on. A united Europe must be more than transnational institutions and meeting of European Union leaders. If Europe is to save its soul, Europeans must ultimately imagine themselves to be European, rooted in nationalities, but also a distinct people, destined to a common fate in a globalised competitive world. The historic idea of Europe needs to be given new life. He's saying, uh, in the 21st century, religious reconciliation could be a resource of European identity. But by the church, uniting people together, that will get an identity for the, Jewish, for the um, people of Europe. And very interesting, the, the very last thing that Benedict did as a pope was to make a little subtle change when they're doing their sprinkling of babies the wording in English is the Christian community welcomes you with great joy. Now he changed that so they no longer say the Christian community welcomes you with great joy but they say the church of God welcomes you with great joy. In other words he was separating the Roman Catholic Church from all the other denominations Protestants included who are the Christian community. He was saying, no, you have become a member of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's the church that you have entered into. And he sees making this church a strong power that people can come to uh, is what his work is about. So that was Benedict's last work, and as it were, Francis is carrying on in that same spirit.